Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our Monday night Bible study and prayer night. We're glad that you have joined us tonight. We have a big night planned as we continue our Bible reading plan. This year's plan is different than anything that we've done before, and I am really loving it. I'm, I feel like I personally am learning so much um, as we go through this, but it's called a redemptive historical plan. And the goal is to connect dots from the Old Testament to the New Testament and find Jesus throughout scripture. And so it's been a really cool journey so far. So we're glad that you're here jumping in with us tonight. If you are not following along uh, with our Bible reading plan and you would like to, you can find it at nhcbrp.com. You can also find what we call our insight posts that we write every week. And those are just our thoughts as we go through the reading. And they're listed there on that website, but you can also have them sent to your phone as a text message by texting the word Bible to 703-971-4673. So tonight we're going to be focusing on Genesis chapter 12, um, part of Matthew chapter 1, Genesis chapter 14, and Romans 4. So Rusty's going to kick off our reading um, tonight, but before he does, I'm going to open us up in prayer. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time to just hit pause um, for a little bit and study your word and talk about the things that um, that you've brought to light for us in them. I pray that you would guide our discussion tonight. I just pray that you would open our hearts, our ears, our minds, so that we can receive what you have for us. Thank you so much for your love and your care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, I'll be reading Genesis chapter 12. This is from the New Living Translation. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Merah, and at the time the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to, appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the south or to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarah, look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, um, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. And sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarah's beauty. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarah was taken into his palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts because of, because of her sheep, goats, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply. What have you done to me? He demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and get out of here. Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them. And he sent Abram um, out of the country along with his wife and all his possessions. Okay, I'm going to jump over to Matthew chapter one. I'm going to read verses one through 17. This is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab. 
Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers born, born at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim and the father was the father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud. Abiud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Akim. Akim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer was the father of Mathen. Mathen was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. All right, take a breath. That was an impressive uh, enunciation of all of those. <laughs> um, I thought I had it bad, but you might have beat me, Kim. I'm in Genesis 14, and I'm going to now butcher all of these kings' names. Uh, <laughs> one year later... Kelalomer and his allies arrived and defeated the Raphaites at Ashtaroth Critium, the Zuzits at Ham, the Emmets at Shelva, yep, and the Hortis at the edge of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to and Mishpat and conquered all the territory of the Amalekites and also the Amorites living in Hazonian Tamar. Then it appears that a bunch of kings prepared for battle in the Valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against a bunch of other kings, it appears. But the interesting thing, it was four kings against five. As it happened, the Valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits, while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. They also captured Lot, Abraham's nephew, Abram's nephew who lived in Sodom, and carried off everything he owned. But one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram, the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mimri the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives were Abraham's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Then he pursued Catalamari's army until he caught up with them at Dan. Really, Dan? After all that, it's Dan. <laughs> there he divided his men and attacked during the night. Catalamari's army fled, but Abram chased him as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abram discovered all the good things that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. After Abram returned from victory over Kadal Lamar and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or Salem and a priest of the God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham, Abram by God's Most High, creator in heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. This gave Meshadak a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Hey, 
but you caught me out there, David. <laughs> I've got it easy, I think, with uh, Romans 4. I think I might have to take a hit next week. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so Romans 4. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. This blessedness only for the circumcised, is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Was it not after? It was, sorry, not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who will also follow the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and there is no law there, if there's no law there is no transgression therefore the promise comes by faith so that it might be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring not only to those who are of the law but also to those who have faith the faith of Abraham he is the father of us all it is written I have made you a father of many nations he is our father in the sight of God in whom who in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his face, he faced faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And Sarah's room, womb was already, was, oh, it doesn't, I don't need any hard words to trip up my words today. <laughs> and then Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited him were written not for him alone, but for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Okay. All so right. yeah, that was that was a lot there. Um that was good. Um I found a little video from the Bible project that talks about um, Abram, Abraham and Melchizedek. Um, And I wanted to show it to you guys. It goes a little bit further um, in our reading than, than we are um, tonight, but it is stuff that we will be coming to. So I thought it would be good. And we're going to kind of give you a preview of some things that are coming. So let's go ahead and show that video. We are walking through the story of the Bible, focusing on the role of priests. And that story begins with God creating a garden called Eden. Where heaven and earth are one. 
And God places humans in the garden to be his royal image, his priests, so that humans and God can work together as one. And this whole setup is called God's blessing. But tragically, the priestly humans are duped into rebelling against God and then exiled from the garden. But God promises that one day a descendant will come to defeat that evil deceiver and restore humanity as royal priests. And we learn he'll be both a priest and a sacrifice. But as it stands, humanity is outside of Eden and things have spiraled into chaotic violence. But God chooses from the wreckage a couple, Abraham and Sarah. And God calls them to journey to the land of Canaan, and he promises to give them a huge family and all the blessings of Eden. Now, the blessing isn't just for them. The goal is that God's blessing flows through their family out to all the nations. And so that makes Abraham's family like a priesthood. So is Abraham that royal priest we've been hoping for? Well, no. But Abraham does meet a mysterious figure who reminds us of that promised royal priest. And who is this? Well, Abraham is returning victorious from a risky battle. And he passes by the city of Shalem, and this king comes out to meet him. And we're told that this king is also a priest who serves the same God that Abraham does. Ah, yes, Melchizedek. This man's a mystery. We don't know why he worships Abraham's God. We don't even know his family lineage. Exactly. But here's what happens. Melchizedek brings this great feast out to Abraham and his army, and then he gives God's blessing to Abraham, saying God is the one who gave him this victory over his enemies. Then Abraham gives Melchizedek one-tenth of everything that he has, and that's the story. So what is it all about? Well, Melchizedek is the king and the priest of Shalem, which is an ancient name short for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which will later become the capital of Abraham's future family, where the temple is built. And that 10% that Abraham gives Melchizedek, that's just like the 10% Israelites will later give to honor the priests who work in the temple. Exactly. And so here is Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and he's honoring a royal priesthood that existed long before Israel's temple or their priests. Ah, Melchizedek. Yeah, he's super important. And we'll come back to him when we get to the story of David. Okay, back to Abraham. We find out that he and Sarah are unable to have kids. And they're really old. So how are they going to have a family? Well, they scheme up their own plan. Sarah forces her Egyptian slave to produce a child with Abraham. But once that happens, Sarah ends up despising her slave and oppressing her. So instead of trusting God for a family, they do it on their own terms. Right. And so God eventually does give them their own son, Isaac. But then God promptly asks for the life of that son back. Abraham is called to offer up Isaac on a mountain as a sacrifice. And we're told this is a test. God's requiring Abraham to own up to his failures, to stop his scheming, and to surrender his family's future to God. Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain, build an altar, and right as Abraham is about to offer up his son, God stops him, and he provides a substitute ram that can be sacrificed in Isaac's place. And here, the narrator stops the story and starts speaking to you, the reader, saying, this is why we today say, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. The mountain of Yahweh, that's Jerusalem. That's right. And so notice in both of these stories we've looked at, Abraham is near that high place that will later be called Jerusalem. In the first story, Abraham meets a royal priest. And in the second story, God provides a substitute sacrifice that covers for the sins of Abraham's family. Yes, and both of these stories point forward to the need for a future royal priest who will also become a sacrifice for the sins of Abraham and his family. From here, Abraham's family grows to become an entire people, but they eventually end up as slaves in Egypt. And so, how can a group of slaves produce a royal priest? Exactly. And so that brings us to Moses, whose story we're going to look at next.
Pretty cool, huh? I like that. Um, what is that Jerusalem one? Salam? Salam? How, how is Jerusalem? Salam? Well, yeah, in our in our Bibles, it's like Salem, S A L E M, but but yeah, that was that became Jerusalem. Pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. I said, "Oh wow!" When it was, I hope my mic was on mute. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what stood out to you? Where should we start? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, for me, it was I, I. And Russ, you went to seminary. I think you know what? Why? Why do we have to do all those names? I mean, I know it proves the lineage and God's promise, right? You know, from Abraham all the way through the Messiah. But like, it is can't you just say it was? Yeah, but if people are investigating it, the more detailed you can be, the more it holds up to scrutiny. Um, and so the the those genealogy, like in Matthew, but then the other names, you can you can go back and test is that is that a real person rather than saying you know, um, sometimes somewhere it's this specific place, these specific people. Um, and because God designed the Bible to be explored, to investigate the claims, to see if they're true or not. So, yeah, it's it, 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 it is it's embarrassing at times when you're saying a name six different ways. But these are real people. Um, and I think it just adds so much validity to to the Bible. So it's well, it, it also goes like it uh, when I was reading that Genesis 14, uh, he mobilized 318 men. Yeah. Like you couldn't just say several hundred men. Like <laughs> that stands out to me when and it and to your point, I think it gives it credence and gives it some some factual basis for it when you say 318. Like somebody actually must have counted and known that was the amount. It wasn't just several hundred men went to battle. Mm -hmm. And probably they were going against a whole lot more, but it does say that God gave them the victory. Um and you see that we'll see that with Gideon and others where being outnumbered. Um, and I, yeah, I, it's, it's pretty cool. The Bible is not like other religions writings because they can be very, you know, they kind of once upon a time thing. This is in a specific time, specific place, specific people. Mm -hmm. And somebody must have been writing it down somehow as well. Like, yeah. It's kind of, writing those sort of facts like the 318 and the rest mm -hmm. of it um yeah knew it was important <laughs> yeah yeah the um the thing about the the genealogy in matthew that a couple of things that stood out to me you know when you're thinking about the books the who it was written to is is an important piece and so matthew was writing to jews and so being able to trace um, Jesus, you know, to David and to Abraham was, you know, was a big deal. But then, you know, there at the end of that passage, um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say that Jesus was Joseph's son, you know, um, he, Joseph was legally, you know, was his father and he makes a, um, so he's included because of that, but he was, you know, was listed as Mary's son. And then Luke also does a genealogy, but Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just, it's interesting how based on who they were writing to is how they, yeah. they chose to, you know, to lay that out. I think that's pretty cool. And they matched the 14 that you have in Gen in, in Matthew matched the, what Luke wrote. Well, I think Luke has some additional stuff. But in like, there, like, but yeah, but in addition to, but the ones that they both said matched. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost always, there's a couple that are different, and the thought is there may have been that Leverite marriage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone died, and so they take on another name. There, there are a couple of things, but for the most part, yeah, they do match. They just one goes back all the way to the beginning, and they leave some out. I mean, this is not everybody that was ever in that. Matthew deliberately uses that 14. He skips some, but he's trying to make a point. Um, he hadn't. It doesn't change the truth of it. Um, yeah, it's very, true. and you know, and then Matthew also has the four women mentioned, which the Jews wouldn't have, at that culture, women weren't part of genealogies. It was all male dominated. Mm -hmm. That's cool. 
Yeah, I was reading how um, with the 14, the three 14s, that um, any time seven is doubled, you know, seven being perfection, it was um, kind of a super perfection, <laughs> absolute ultimate perfection. Mm-hmm. So you've got thing, but then for that to be mentioned three times points to even more importance of, um, you know, the coming of Jesus and him being Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That was one of the questions that I had was the the importance of the of 14, you know, that he that he was um very specific, you know, in in pointing that out. So that's cool. Um the other thing that um that stood out to me back in Genesis 12 was about um I read a little bit about, you know, when it talks about the great tree of Mora. Um And in one of the commentaries I read, it said that this was one of several large trees in Canaan that were prominent places used to worship pagan gods. Mm -hmm. Um, And it even brought up the point that, you know, potentially Abram building an altar there uh, to the one true God was um, was almost like a, um, you know, a challenge that this is, you know, this was the one true God um, that deserved to have an altar built there. But then um, don't we hear about that? Doesn't that, um, that tree, doesn't that Mora, doesn't that come up again at another point? I think, I I think for some reason that it's, that we hear about that again, but I didn't, um, I didn't do any searching on that. I'll have to go back and and look it up. Um, So and then, um, of course, the Melchizedek stuff, um, you know, and we hear more about him in the New Testament. Um, so yeah. he was well, pretty read big about deal. him in Hebrews a good bit. Mm hmm. Yeah, that Mora thing, that's interesting. That that'll be worth doing some research on. And I might be wrong. I thought I thought it was um was something that is mentioned um in another place, but um um it's in in Judges, in Judges seven, um, where it's talking about Gideon. Uh, the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near, near the hill near the hill of Mora. Um, okay. So, um, some of these, you know, some of these places and things that are mentioned, like what we were talking about before, about you know Salem and Jerusalem and and all of that. It's it's cool to make note of that and then see when it pops up again. Um, you know, and how, how some of these places get, um, prominence in different, you know, Mm -hmm. at different times. One of the things that I've always enjoyed is the, uh, Sarah and Abram, Abraham story about being barren. And I went, uh, I wanted to see how they did it in the message. And so I was reading, uh, Romans four, this would be roughly, uh verse 18 in a because the message does groupings of verses but it -hmm. said when everything was hopeless abraham believed anyway deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do but on what god said he would do wow Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah how many times do i live feeling hope uh, I've been known to be pessimistic. Let's call it what it is or cynical, but deciding to live not on the basis of what I see I can't do, but what God said he would do. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, to me, it was just, it was a, it was a great way of wording that, that translation of what Abraham was going through and then go further down in 20. um, It said, Abraham didn't tiptoe around God's promise 
asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he said. Mm. What a difference we could live if we kept those two statements of faith in our hearts and in our minds as we go through our day. I just, yeah, that really nailed it for me. Now, the message doesn't always work for me. Sometimes it's a little too, but it worked for me in this case in, in a big way. And that was, was just a challenge to me. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that goes with that is, so how did he get to that point? Because we've already read about some places where he was, um, we'll say he was less than trusting. Um, mm-hmm. Gives his wife away as his sister to pre- protect him. Um, you know, there's, there's, he didn't, he didn't just automatically show up with faith like this. He had learned it over time, the hard way. Uh, but he really had learned it. He hadn't gotten bitter. He'd really be, you know, they'll either become bitter or better. And Abraham really had risen to it. But it, man, the fact that we've got evidence and the stories of him blowing it is really encouraging. Well, it makes it that much more impactful, right? When you know where he's been and where he is in his journey, his spiritual relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. And then you see this and then God being faithful to him and rewarding him with the whole list. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, before we started this this Bible reading plan this year, I really I I prayed that God would help me to you know, that he would open my eyes to things that I hadn't seen before and you know, would really allow me to make connections and some things because especially in some of the Old Testament stories, you know, I've I've heard them and read them most of my life. And, you know, and I've kind of formed my thoughts about them, you know, and I had shared with you guys about um, the Noah story, you know, was, was always a difficult one for me. And I really felt like God gave me new perspective on it, you know, in, in reading through it um, in the context of this plan. And so I feel like the same thing happened in Romans 12. I mean, in um, Genesis 12, that whole thing with Abram and, and, Sarah and, you know, she's my sister like that, that just always really, you know, and we don't hear anything from Sarah. We don't know what that was like for her. I mean, it certainly kind of implies that, you know, Pharaoh took her as his wife, you know, and all that goes along with that. Um, But in when I was reading at this time and I was praying about it as I was reading and just was sort of like, you know, I get that piece of the Bible is such a such a picture of God working through imperfect, flawed people. You know, I, I completely get that and embrace that. But there's still something within me that wants, wants the main character to be the good guy, you know, like just really wants him all to all the way be, through. Yeah, yeah. And I had this thought that was that I I feel like was from God because it it was definitely not my own. But the thought was the story's not about Abram. It's about me. It's about God. It's this is a God story. It's not an Abraham story. And so this morning in my reading, so that happened like several days ago. This morning in my reading, I also was reading in the message and listened to this out of Romans four, and this is about two B to three um, in the message. And it says, but the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. What we read in scripture is Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. So pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, I was um I was listening to a Bible project podcast, Kim. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um they were framing it as God's generosity. Um as saying, like, okay, you know, generous God gives Garden of Eden, Adam, perfect world. That didn't work out. You know, so we're trying again with Noah, <laughs> you know, from the flood. We're starting again and Abraham being the descendant of, of Noah in his family line. And, you know, here we go again. And God's trying yet again to 
give creation a gift and you know we were doing our best to at every turn to mess it up basically but how you know in this story with um Sarah and Abraham and you know her being given to the king again trying to mess it up but God's like "Eh, no no plagues on the household no we're not doing (laughs) we we are steering the ship this way this gift will be given and um, so yeah you know and then they track it all the way to you know funnily enough our readings the same like to the genealogy of Jesus of you know the ultimate gift that we get there you know and, and obviously that's what we have to say but um I just thought that was a cool interpretation of, of uh overview of you know God's goodness to us yeah. in his um, yeah. that that is the redemption of that story for me <laughs> yeah. when, when God you know because he he didn't that wasn't the way it was it was supposed to work you know and he didn't he didn't uh when he gave when he gave that promise to Abraham, he gave it to Sarah too. You know, she was, she was going to have a role in that. Um, and so that's, that's the, that's the redeeming part of that to me. Yeah. yeah. Anything else stand out? Well, kind of a thought I had um, related to that. Um, like when I, when I became a Christian, my mom forgot everything wrong I'd ever done. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is before she had Alzheimer's. Um, And it used to drive Becky and my sister crazy because she just treated me like a little king. I had been a horrible mess, but she was so grateful that she just, she just, uh, just wrote all that stuff off. And the problem is if we're not careful, we can do that biblically too, where we only want to hear the good parts of a story. We don't want to think of the other. Um, we don't want to think that, you know, here's Abraham. He was, you know, the, the the father of the whole nation. But yet, you know, he had done immature and evil things, um, sometimes just trying to do God's work with shortcuts. But I think we do a, a disfavor if we're not honest, mm-hmm. um, because it sets up these images for people that they just can't, they can't relate to. I can't, no one can relate to perfection. Mm-hmm. Um and I think it's 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 really I saw one thing I love about my small group is that um, we reminded everyone again today what's said in group stays in group and it allows people to be honest. And I could see today there were some people shocked by where someone used to be. They don't see them there now. They see them. They see a, fi- a more finished product. But there's hope when we get to hear a failure. We will see that with King David. I mean, he could have had the royal scribe edit all of that out, whitewash it, spin it to where he was just always the perfect guy. But to his credit, and thank God, he, we know the story. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's a good reminder that the Bible has recorded the warts and all of our heroes and heroines. Otherwise it would be hope. it, It would just be overwhelmingly hopeless, I think. Yeah. You know, I've I've heard your mom talk about her how she really wrestled in prayer, you know, for years for you. And I think when when her prayers were finally answered, you know, when she looked at you, all she could see was God's faithfulness, you know. Yeah. And what a picture of God, you know, that when he when he looks at us, you know, through Jesus, all he sees, you know, is is his faithfulness to us and, you know, yeah. what that's brought. He sees the new creature. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Hmm. And it should give us hope too, for people that we know that are doing the shortcuts now, we don't give up on them. We yeah. we don't shy away from the truth, but we, we extend grace. We want to be there to help catch them when they fall and in, in hopes that they'll, um, they'll turn to the father. Mm-hmm. And you're so good at that as well, Rusty. I don't think I've ever seen you write anyone off. <laughs> if I look in the mirror, it makes it a little, a little bit hard. Mm. Uh. Um, what about the tar pits? Like I, I did a little bit, <laughs> did a little bit of um, reading about that, and there were a lot of different ideas about what those like one thing I read said it was um was actually like petroleum you know um bubbling up and and then another thing um 
said it was, you know, some kind of like asphalt type stuff and, you know, like that, I guess that was just a natural part of that area. Yeah, because it says, as it happened, the Valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits while the others escaped to the mountains. Yeah. Sounds like it was part of the natural nature topography or whatever of the land, but. Yeah. Well, one thing that I read, because I was thinking, how do you accidentally fall into a tar pit? I mean, I guess if you're, if you're running <laughs> and you're, you know, but one thing that I read said that, um, that they could have been like, um, you know, some of them could have been partially covered with, you know, foliage, whatever was, you mm -hmm. know, around and stuff so that they wouldn't necessarily stand out. Um, you know, I kept picturing, uh, you know, quicksand in the movies, like how yeah. people get stuck in the quicksand and, oh, no, look at me. And I was thinking, like, here are these great warriors flooding, you know, running battle, and then they just fall into a tar pit, and that's it. Good night. Well, they yeah. have tar pits in near Los Angeles, don't they? The La Brea tar pit. Oh, yeah. Um, if you saw the movie Volcano with Tommy Tommy Lee Jones, you would have seen that because it huh. starts bubbling up and more. <laughs> hmm. You see that, Russ. So uh -huh. Walls and there was no tar pits in there. It was really good. You'd have liked it. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, any other questions that people had? Um, oh, go I've ahead. got a question. Um, how did God appear to Abraham? Um, it says in chapter 12, verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Your offspring are right. Like normally that's a really big deal when God appears to someone, right? I was thinking like Moses, how, okay, he appeared in the burning bush or he's going to appear in the wind or, you know, he's, he's going to, God's going to pass by him and he's got a face this way because you can't see him. Like there was all these sort of like outlaying things um, going on when God appeared to someone. Um, and it just says, and God appeared to Abraham. Did he just appear to him <laughs> in himself, you know? Hmm. Did when Abraham it starts off, it said, the Lord said to Abraham. What's so that? God's been talking to him, and then he appears to him some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. Did anyone else think that or find anything? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, I thought that. I didn't I didn't find anything um, about it. But I, I, I did um, read about, you know, one of the things that happened as a result of that was he Abraham built an altar, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that whole role of altars, you know, not only as a place of sacrifice, but also a remembrance, you know, uh, memorializing, you know, something that had happened. And um, so, so, you know, obviously it was a big deal, you know, but I, but yeah, it's another one of those things. I wish we had more details about what that was actually like and calling it Bethel I know that means house of God but that whole Canaanite area is like Israel Palestine West Bank like all of those today you know um it's just fascinating where things happened when you start looking up you know walking around those lands who knows what's happened on that soil <laughs> what was what was, oh go ahead Russ well, one of the things to me about that that's interesting is I know I would be tempted if God appeared to me, I'd be tempted to write a book about it and make that uh, this huge deal. And in this case, it's it's not a throwaway, but it's God appeared to Abraham and he did this. It what He didn't, they didn't make it, a, a, I mean, it's important, but they didn't make it, a sen they didn't sensationalize it, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Um, and it, And I think it's kind of cool that it doesn't tell us all the details about it. We know, you know the angels that come, there are different ways that God reveals himself. We'll see that later. Um, but it is, it is, it's, it's puzzling, but it's also interesting too, that there's not some major whole chapter devoted to that. Mm -hmm. I was or wondering. Can, no, go ahead. Uh, well, let's let uh, Emma finish this thought out before I open up another Okay, this is one quick thing. I was I was wondering if like he had to appear to him because this was such a, you know, a, a big deal that that Abraham would eventually follow through and 
you know, hang on to this promise um, mm-hmm. because in Jesus' line that is like, okay, I've spoken to him, but I'm going to have to really appear to him <laughs> and he cannot say no to that, <laughs> right? Yeah. That would surely build his faith, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, David, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, Kim, do I have time to bring up a different thing? Yeah. So in Romans 4, 4, in 5, I'd be curious what you all thought. It says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous without working for it. And then they do that blessing. Is that the whole good works versus faith kind of thing? Because it, it says, you know, not because of the work, because of their faith in God. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just was an interesting parallel between work and wages and what you earn versus a gift. But people are, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was kind of sing-songy for me. And I just wondered if was there anything more there that I'm missing other than the duh moment of it's not by works, it's by faith. Mm-hmm. I think you gave a good synopsis of that. Um, yeah. It's also back to that definition of grace is not getting what I deserve, but getting what I need. Because mm-hmm. um, the law, and we'll see this later too, when we look in Galatians, that God gave the Ten Commandments not to save people, but to show them their need to be saved. Um, and the Jews, you know, the ones that the ones that antagonize Paul the most are the ones that just trying to get everyone to follow the laws, all, all of them, and get circumcised. And so he's making a big point here that um, that's just not the way it works. Mm-hmm. But I think your synopsis is spot on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much like a theologian. <laughs> Especially after reading all those things, I really feel like I nailed it. It makes me think about how, you know, like, for for us as humans and and reading reading this makes me think that you know like it's been this way forever like we we have this idea in our minds of what's what's fair what's not fair you know like you you earn what you get you know and that's what makes grace you know so um hard to wrap our our heads around but you know i'm not sure that that fairness is necessarily something that God uses as a, you know, as a, as a standard, um, you know, like in the way that we think about it anyway, um, you know, because you look at some people and and you think, you know, that's the things that they, that they're dealing with or the things that, you know, are positive things or, you know, that you, you think they don't deserve and they have them anyway. And there seems like there's an unfairness in that when you look at someone else that's, you think is really deserving. And, you know, I just, it just is a reminder to me that God doesn't view things the same way I do. Along those lines, I wrote down, it says in verse five, but people are counted as righteous, righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith. And I'm thinking in, today's society are people really not defined by their work i mean it seems so counter to where we are as a society that what's the first thing you ask somebody when you meet them hey sir what do you do you don't say hey how's your faith (laughs) you know and it's and you know media and advertising everything is like you gotta have like those stupid christmas commercials where the wife gets the dad a dog and then he gets her a truck like who it doesn't happen but we're defined by our work and our haves and our have nots, not by our faith, like God is, you know, and I just, I struggle with that a little bit, trying to figure out what's my role in that and how am I going to be counter to that? Mm -hmm. What do you say? Oh, totally. Um, (laughs) I agree. Um, Yeah. Our value is totally what we do. And that moves us away from, really who we are who god's made us to be but it goes back to kim's point she just made about this has been going on forever (laughs) and it's Mm -hmm. like we're still missing the mark it seems like so yeah yeah definitely it's um i don't know if we'll ever quite get that out of society but you know as believers i think you know we're called to look at something very different in people other than what people do yeah yeah 
there was one other thing I wanted to bring up about Abraham and, you know, we've talked about how, um, you know, that God spoke to him, he appeared to him in some fashion, but then there's also, um, in James chapter two, verse 23, it says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there aren't, there aren't many times in scripture that that is, you know, that someone is given that designation of, of being God's friend. But, um, but that was, that was something that was said about Abraham. It's pretty Mm -hmm. cool. Yes. Yeah. You think of um, David like that too, how much sin he had and um, not you, David, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you know, someone like Abraham, someone like David, that, like you're saying, Rossi, that you can be imperfect, but mm-hmm. by God's grace, that's amazing. But yeah. Be a friend yeah. of God. Mm-hmm. Encouraging. All right. So um, any any final final thoughts? Okay. M, I'm going to turn it over to you. I think I've got a li- I've been making a list of things to look up. So I think I've got more work to do on <laughs> these chapters <laughs> as uh, moving on. So, and I've also got to look up those tar pits by LA as well. <laughs> That's on my list. <laughs> anyway, um, so last week, David had a brilliant idea about breast prayer. <laughs> do you remember that, David? I said I was doing some rhythmic breathing during the and Russ, you would have been really impressed by that. Um, and it just kind of level set where I was. So that was nice. So what do we are we in, now we you're doing, doing breath prayer? We haven't done it for ages. So you know, you might have done it for, but it doesn't matter. So, no, we do. so we do it. Um so a breath prayer is <clears throat> something that you recite to yourself as you know a repetition and you're breathing in same part of the word breathing out same part of the word and it's an ancient uh, form of prayer and it isn't a prayer to replace other prayers it's more of a prayer to get you in a place ready to pray other prayers <clears throat> and um to spend time in God's presence that way that you might sort of tune out of what's been going on um, in your current reality and you're choosing to take a break and um, asking God to you know be present with you and for you to recognize his presence and for him to speak to you for his Holy Spirit to speak to you from that point and um, guide you in prayer however he would um, so it's a real sort of practice in that way that we get better at listening to the Holy Spirit in our prayers um, if we start in a place um, where we're listening. Um, and so before we practice that, last week I asked a question for Kim and David, and I'm going to ask another question. <laughs> and I didn't warn them this week. I warned them last week. Um, but my question this week is um, when you pray, when you like have your quiet times or, you know, you're sitting down having a prayer time with God, what do you do first? Because I think people order it differently. It might just be helpful for people to hear other people's process. Yeah, I'll defer to you, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, something that I've started doing, and that um, that then when I when I skip over it, I I feel badly about it. I I have started my time with, um, with greeting God, you know, just, you know, as if, um, I mean, he is in the room with me, but, you know, but like, as if he was physically sitting in the room with me, I I had a thought a while back that, you know, I often just come in and, you know, I start reading my Bible and then I start praying and, you know, and, and I just had this, this image in my mind of, you know, like one of you guys sitting in the room and me never even acknowledging <laughs> that you're there while I go through my thing. So the the first thing that I try to do is, is acknowledge God and, you know, thank him for waking me up and getting me up that day. I love that. I think, I think for me, it's, uh, and this might not be a surprise, but I try to go to the same place that's free of my laptop or my electronics 
um, just freedom. So I, my, I'm not, uh, I'm not unfocused. I'm, I'm zeroed in on one thing because if my laptop's there and it dings or an email comes in, I'm like, Oh, you know, and I'm not doing the hunt. So I have to be real conscientious about where I have my quiet time and how I do it. Um, I'm not always consistent with it, but I also know that the best quiet times I have, and I hear from God the most when I do uh, intentionality around where I'm going to do it and what the setup looks like for me. Yeah. And I have to have paper and pen because I feel like I hear things or write things down and then I go back and look at, and I, I have a book and I tape stuff in it, like little scraps of paper. It's like a, it's, it's horrible, but it works for me and it's great to go back and see uh, when he's done something that I don't see, but then see, so yeah. oh, that's that's great. See, you you're practicing silence and solitude there without realizing it, David. Last week you were practicing breath prayer without realizing it. I find that a lot of things that I do are because you sneakily put it into my life in my head and my heart, and it's uh, before you know it, I'm going to have a scarf collection of prayer yeah. scarves. And, and oil, I hope anointing oil. I'm going to be dancing around the room with my scarf, just enjoying my time with God. I see it. <laughs> oh dear, Rusty, could you maybe bring us back? <laughs> the whole D- David dancing with the scarves has kind of got me sidetracked. Um, I think for me that um, I've tried to make it a habit of whenever I'm praying is to start off just thanking God specifically for certain things. Um, I like Kim's idea of if you just, if someone just walked in your office or you walked in theirs, would you just start hitting them with, hitting them with things or would you recognize them as a person and something like that? So I think, I'm not sure how I do, but normally it's just that there's a, uh, Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So I, I try, I just try, try to express thanks because it, it level sets me in, in ways that are, and then if I get interrupted, at least I, I got that part done. So um, I think that's mine. Thank you. Thanks guys. Yeah. They're all really good ways of uh, sort of getting rid of the distractions and focusing on God. So it's great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read out a few um, phrases from Psalms or, you know, actually scripture um, that might be paraphrased, but um, just as ideas of things that you could repeat when you're doing a breath prayer, just so you can get an idea of what it might sound like um, and then give you some time to pray. Um, but when you're praying, just ask God what words he would give you if it's a phrase or a word to repeat to him and then you know I'll I'll time a little bit of time and just spend time repeating that word or phrase once you have it in your mind and um, you know just capture any thought that goes past it doesn't have to be blaring in volume it doesn't have to be you know written in lights it can just be a very small uh, nudge often it is of God's voice speaking to you and um, see see what he says. Um, so, all right, let's pray. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we invite you to this time. We know you're present with us. We know that your home is in us anyway. And forgive us, God, for doing things our own way so much. We often live like you don't live in us. So God, I pray that when we come to you, we would really realize who we're speaking to and who we're asking um, to speak to us, that God Almighty, Most High God, um, that we would put you in your rightful place and come to you with reverence and gratefulness Um, that we can be your friend and that you have redeemed us and that you don't look on us um, with scorn Um, but Jesus' blood covers us. 
And um, Father, help each one of us now to hear from you a word or a phrase um, that would bring us closer to you as we re-repeat it, as we practice praying to you all today. So um, just some phrases based on Psalm 61. In Christ alone, my soul finds rest. In Christ alone, my soul finds rest. Based on Romans 8.15, Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Based on Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So we'll just pray your own prayer now, asking God to give you a word or a phrase. To repeat slowly to him. And now when um, you're aware of God's presence, is he leading you to pray in any particular way for any situation that you know of with friends, family, in your own life, maybe a global situation? And just pray that now. Father, we add our amen to all these prayers and thank you for this time with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. This went in a lot of different directions. I, I really liked what we did today and just being able to read the Old and New Testament related to um, Abraham. And I, something Kim said really struck me. She said that the story, I should look at the stories as being about God and then also me. I Watch what is going on, but bring it back home. What is God trying to show me in my life? Lesson that I can learn, examples to follow, or things not to do and to not be a casual spectator. And um, so anyway, this is, i, I Appreciate all you guys have brought to the table. I now have my sheet of things I've got to work on too. So 
Um, thank you a bunch. And I needed that prayer, Miss Emma. I have uh, been blowing and going. And to be quiet like that, I didn't realize just how much I needed it. So thank you. Until that close. big giant dog barked. That was terrifying. <laughs> it's like the enemy is in my head. Get out. <laughs> and Emma just goes to me. Emma just goes, oh, Father God. <laughs> just, you know, she just transitions. No problem at all. I'm completely wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't what know. My can be quiet for the whole hour, but in prayer time, you know. <laughs> Wow. The enemy's working through your dog. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right. Rusty, close us in prayer. We'll hope no dog barks. I will be glad to. God, thank you again for the um, giving us what we have in the Bible. Um, giving people the insight to write things down, to remember the important things, the stories of faith that are not these airbrush stories, but are real and and honest and and at the end of the day, really, really hopeful. Um, help us to never get satisfied, but to always see what we can do to stretch ourselves and to grow and to learn. And may that be contagious throughout our church in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. See you, everybody. Have a good week. See you, everybody.